Let's continue talking about why, after 400 years, African Americans have not built wealth that's measurable and collective. Let's talk about it. Get ready for a kingdom encounter. The kingdom of God, justice and righteousness. A kingdom encounter. Teaching believers, training leaders, transforming communities. It's a kingdom, kingdom encounter. So I have been talking about why African Americans have been in this country for over a little bit over 400 years, and we have not built any measurable wealth. That is a question that baffles me, and we want to know whether or not it is the result of things endemic in the uh, black community that prevent us from building wealth, or whether it is systemic racism, or perhaps both. A little bit of one, a whole lot of the other, vice versa. We just need to know because we shouldn't be in any nation for 400 years and not have built any considerable, measurable wealth. Something is really wrong when that happens. And in order for us to change it, for us, in order for us to address that, we must ask the question, why? Or why not? And that's what we've been doing. Now, let's turn to James chapter 5, and we'll read several verses of Scripture. Because I want you to know that this question is rooted in the Word of God. This is not a question that I'm asking because I am promoting some activism or because I am a politician, which I'm not, um, or to stare up, you know, racial problems. That's not my goal. My goal simply is to ask a question about why my ethnicity has been in a country for 400 years and we haven't created any measurable wealth. I want to know. And once we know, we can change it. Once we know, we can start correcting it. I read something recently that is just simply astounding. And it is economists predict that in 20, 30 years, African Americans collectively will have no wealth. No wealth. None. Zero. Nada. After 400 years, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it angers me and it saddens me. And I want to know why. And so I've been studying the topic and I'm presenting you what I have discovered. All right. Now, again, let's go to the Bible because my question is rooted in the Word of God. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Listen, all you who are rich, for it's time to weep and to owl over the misery and howl over the misery that will overtake you. Your riches lie rotting, your fine clothing eaten by moss, and your gold and silver are corroded as a witness against you. You have hoarded up treasure for the last days, but it will become a fire to burn your flesh. Listen, can't you hear the cries of the laborers over the wages you fraudulently held back from those who worked for you? The cries for justice of those you've cheated have reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have indulged yourself with every luxury and pleasure this world offers, but you've only but you're only stuffing your heart full of a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered good and innocent people who had no power 
to defend themselves. That's James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And I believe these verses speak directly to the question that I'm asking. It speaks directly to us as African Americans, and it speaks directly to white America. So it's the reason why we read those scriptures. Now, early on, I gave you three reasons why I'm teaching this message. Three reasons. Let me share them with you again because I want you to stay alert as to why I'm teaching this. All right, so the first purpose I'm teaching, the first reason I'm teaching this is to eliminate confusion among African Americans regarding why we haven't built wealth collectively, to expose the racist methods whites use to prevent or destroy black wealth creation. And third of all, to educate African Americans as to what systemic changes need to occur for black wealth creation collectively. Now, at this part, let's say I was in a trial. Um, I'm an attorney. I've tried cases over the years. And let's say I was at this stage of the trial. I probably at this point would um, call my expert witness. You know, an expert witness is someone who has specialized knowledge, experience, training in an area that can help the jury understand um, the issues in the trial. And they are very instrumental, very um, needed in trials, especially when the, when the issues are complicated and the attorney needs someone with that specialized training and so forth to come and explain to the jury, um, you know, about certain issues. So I'm going to do that here. I kind of approach my messages as if I'm in trial. That's the way I'm trained at this point. So I'm going to call my expert witness now to, uh, to explain some things to you in his words, all right? Um, my expert witness is very much qualified to discuss these issues. So, let's hear from him. What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant, somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? That's a part of it and growing, that grows out of something else. You can't thingify anything without depersonalizing that something. If you use something as a means to an end, at that moment you make it a thing and you depersonalize it. The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here in chains, treated in very inhuman fashion. And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And the other thing is that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually uh, rationalizing that wrong. So slavery was justified morally, biologically, uh, theoretically, scientifically, everything else. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negro's color a stigma. And uh, that can never be uh, overlooked. So I think these things are absolutely necessary. The other thing is that America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation. 
of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, o they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps, but uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. What is all right, so that is my expert witness, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, the late Dr. King, and he laid out for you in under four minutes why he believes African Americans at his point uh, of death um, had not created any measurable wealth. And you 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 hear you heard the the question of the interviewer. He asked Dr. King. What is it about the Negro? It's not the word we would use today. Um, what is it about the African American? And he said, other immigrant groups have come here. Well, let me rephrase that. Other groups have come here and have overcome, you know, being the outsiders. Why is it that the African American? has not. And Dr. King gave four answers in that short statement. One, he said, America thingified blacks. That means that America uh, in law, in custom, reduced blacks to things rather than persons. And again, that was done in law, in law, and in custom, and in religion. Religion, they use religion to support that erroneous notion that blacks are, again, things. So they thingified us. Secondly, he said blacks, unlike any other group of people in America, were enslaved for 250 years. Enslaved, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. No other, no other group. And people always like to say, especially black conservatives, they love to point to other groups of people who came here, and those people came here voluntarily as immigrants, um, and they like to compare African Americans just the way that interviewer did. Why haven't you all done as well as these other groups of people, the Italians, the Germans, the, the Asians? The Asians are doing very well now. And Dr. King says, which I completely agree with, those other groups were not enslaved for 250 years. And then he goes on to say that the African Americans, after slavery was abolished, was not repaired. They were not repaired. And he talked about how it's cruel to say to a man who has no boots to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, 
the system of slavery freed African Americans without boots. And so, again, there has never been any reparations for African Americans. And last of all, he said, while African Americans were never repaired for the damage done to them, white immigrants came here and they were empowered with millions of acres of land, with billions of dollars of subsidies, um, with universities that taught them what to do with the land. And the biggest thing is those immigrants from Europe, be them uh, Italians or British or um, Spaniards, whatever, they shared one thing that we African Americans can never share with them, and that is skin color. We are stamped with a different skin color. And that skin color separates us. And in the law, it has separated us, physically separated us, legally separated us. Today, it doesn't legally separate us, but it does in terms of customs and practices and uh, procedures were still separated. So that is the testimony of my expert witness. And so what I intend to do and what I've been doing is to give you the research to support what Dr. King said. He summed up my argument. And he did it much better than I could. What an eloquent man he was. What an eloquent, educated man he was. Uh, few people, white, black, or otherwise, were as eloquent as that man. So, now, I have referred to a number of resources um, in my study and um, seeking questions, uh, seeking answers to this question, why African Americans have not produced meaningful, measurable wealth collectively in over 400 years. One of the best books I've read about the period, the, the post-bellum period, the period right after slavery, is this book, The Betrayal of the Negro, from Rutherford B. Hayes to Woodrow Wilson. The betrayal of the Negro from Rutherford B. Hayes. He was the president um, after Johnson that um, basically entered into what's known as the Compromise of 1877 that ended Reconstruction, essentially and started the era called redemption, the betrayal of the Negro from Rutherford B. Hayes to Woodrow Wilson. Very, very good book. Written by Rayford Logan, Dr. Rayford Logan. It was written back in 65. Um, then there is The Land Was Ours. And this talks about how black beaches became white wealth in, in the coastal south. How black beaches, again, the name is the land was ours. How black beaches became wet, white wealth in the coastal south. Andrew W. Carr. Okay, another excellent book on this topic. Another book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wickerson. Uh, if you have watched Oprah, if you listen to Oprah, you know that she, this made it on her, on her book list. And it immediately became a bestseller, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Okay, those are 
three of the resources that I'm using in this study. Um, and again, they, the information, the research in my study materials are very much in support of Dr. King, what he just laid out. All right. All right. So let's get into this. Now, last week, I started out by telling you that I wanted to confirm what Dr. Claude Anderson said. Dr. Claude Anderson said that during slavery, African Americans owned 1.5% of America's wealth. And in uh, the 21st century, uh, late into the 21st century, um, African Americans still own 1.5% of America's wealth. Okay? Now, I wanted to research that topic, that number, to see if Dr. Claude Anderson was correct about that. And I had no reason to doubt him. I just wanted to have several different um, um, people to chime in on that. And what, what I discovered was his number is incorrect, but by a very little. So statistically, uh, he is correct. But according to the Federal Reserve Board, let me put that up. According to the Federal Reserve Board, African Americans today hold only 2.9% of the wealth of this country. Again, Dr. Claude Anderson said it was 1.5%. The Federal Reserve Board says it's 2.9%. And again, statistically, that's pretty much the same. I mean, it's just 1.5% different. At any event, it is very, very, very low. After 400 years. After 400 years. And so having been thingified, to use Dr. King's term, and enslaved, never repaired, and competing with people who have gotten, you remember I, 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 I said something in the very beginning. Let's look back at it. Um, I quoted the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. Those scholars said white Americans have been provided with up escalators that can ride to reach they can ride to reach their goals without hurdles. Meanwhile, black Americans have been forced onto down escalators, which they must run up to reach their destination. So, the scholars at the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University agrees with Dr. King. And the reason why is because the facts are the facts. All right, so what we're going to look at today, I've been trying to get at it, get to it. And that is, we're going to get to chattel slavery and how awful it was for black Americans. Dr. John Lawrence. And oh yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm 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 citing sources. I'm not giving you my opinions. I'm citing sources. I'm 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 a well-read. I'm an educated man. Um, I, I I don't 
I, I don't answer questions like this off the top of my head. So that when I discuss these things, when I teach these things, or when I debate these issues, I know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be quoting something that I heard someone say without looking at the facts myself. So, yes. And hopefully you are the kind of listener, the kind of, of, of African-American who want to be enlightened who want to be informed. You know, we shouldn't go to church just to, 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 to shout. Uh, the late Bishop Otis Lockett, my pastor um, um, during college, used to say, we're not going to be happy dummies. We're not going to be happy dummies. And so he sought out to teach us the Bible, to teach us, you know, other things. So Dr. John Lawrence, I don't know if he's a PhD, but I, I, I think so. Um, he wrote a book entitled Slave Narratives. And in the book, he talks about how the American slave system was an exact replica of the Roman law. And under Roman law, the folks who were enslaved were chattel property and they were not capable of personal injuries cognizable by the law. So if someone injured slaves, they couldn't sue the person who injured them because they're property. Property can't sue, right? My phone can't sue me. My car can't sue me. I can do what I want to do with my car. I can take a hammer and go out there and beat my car until it is basically useless. And there isn't a thing anyone can do to me because that is my property. I do what I want to do with my property. And that was the condition of the enslaved African. He was the property of the enslaver. And so whatever they did, whatever they wanted to do, from beating him, murdering him or her, raping him or her, on and on and on, sodomizing him or her, there was nothing that could be done by the law because chattel property does not have any rights, didn't have rights under the slave codes of this nation. They could not take by purchase nor descent. They couldn't have heirs, nor could they make wills. So if they were able to put together any wealth, they couldn't will that wealth to their descendants because the fruit of their labor and their work belong to the enslavers. They could not plead nor be impleaded and were utterly excluded from all civil concerns. No civil rights whatsoever, no civil liberties, none, no voting, nothing. You are nothing. As Dr. King said, you are thingified. You are a thing. Things just sit and be quiet and do what they are assigned to do. That's what things do. And that's what the enslaved African was under the slave codes. They were incapable of marriage, not being entitled to the considerations thereof. So enslaved Africans could not marry. They could not build families. They could not, under slave laws, they could not raise children. They did all of those things at the pleasure of the enslaver. And so, yes, the enslaver wanted them to, to mate and bear children because that meant there were more slaves. In fact, 
African-American men were oftentimes used to breed more children. So one has to wonder, is there even some link between that and the number of African-American children today that are born out of wedlock? So even when I hear people talk about the cultural issues endemic in the black community, I still point to 400 years of oppression because I believe they created many of those pathologies that we decry. So as, as things, as chattel rather than persons, they had no protections under the law and thus could be sold, could be transferred, could be mortgaged, could be pawned. I remember in the, I think it was in the 90s, I started doing a search for my African slave ancestors. And so I went to the, um, to the appropriate office there in North Carolina, the state office. And um, I remember the woman told me, she said, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to put your emotions to the side and you're going to have to think like a business person. And you're going to have to do that because our records, the records that we got on the slaves are business records. They are bills of sales. They are receipts and deeds and mortgages, just like what you would see today at the register of deed for a house, you know, being transferred from one, from the transferor to the transferee, there is a deed of sale that is listed with the register of deeds. So I literally had to go to the courthouse where my family is from and look in the register of deeds. Uh, register of deeds for for uh, records pertaining to my family. And I, 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 in fact, found them. So this sort of brings home, and it brought home to me, that this is real. Chat, we were, our ancestors were literally chattel property. Literally. Literally. The American slave system was based on the Roman phrase, Potus sequitur ventrum, which means that which is born follows the womb. So if, if your mother was enslaved, you would be enslaved for life. It was a life system. All right. So we just covered this slide based on Roman civil law where chattels where chattels of their masters had no names except the masters, no legal rights. Their labor belonged to their masters, uh, could not marry, could not be sold, born into slavery for life, and couldn't be educated. Now, I want to read for you an excerpt from John Lawrence's Bible, pardon me, book, Slave Narratives. And I'm quoting him. He was a white man, by the way. That we may proceed intelligently and in the discussion of the subject upon which we have entered, it is important to understand precisely what American slavery is. Some learned men have confused this subject by confounding the relation of the slave with other relations from which it essentially differs. An apprentice, a miner, hired laborer, serf, or villain is not a slave. All these relations lack, as we shall see, the distinguishing feature of, the, of slavery. The slave is placed in a condition far removed from any other class of human beings in enlightened, civilized, or savage society. He stands in a legal relation be below all others. The American Slave Code describes the slave and slavery with remarkable precision 
and horrible distinctiveness. According to that code, a slave is a chattel. Listen at this. He is body, soul, and spirit to all intents and purposes whatsoever property, the property of the master to whom he belongs. Slavery is that peculiar institution which, originating in piracy, systemically despoils human beings of their manhood, of all inborn rights, degrades them to the state of chattelhood, and forcibly detains them in that degradation. Property in a human creature is the essential and peculiar principle of slavery. This is the basis of the system, and all laws, regulations, usages, deprivations, wrongs, sins, sufferings, and miseries which belong to the system are built upon this foundation. Numerous and cruel systems of oppression have existed, but none of them has ventured to lay sacrilege hands upon the image of God and convert it into a thing. Remember Dr. King talked about thingified? Well, John Launch wrote about thingification in his slave narratives, which was written many years before King uh, was even born. All right? Um, so convert it into, let me read that sentence again. Numerous and cruel systems of oppression have existed, but not one of them has ventured to lay sacrilegious hands upon the image of God. Uh, that, that should stand out for us as Christians. John Lawrence said, there have been cruel systems. Don't, don't think there haven't been. But none of them have gone to the extent of transforming what was created in the image of God into a thing. That's what the American slave system did in precise details. It took the African from the status of being made in the image of God and reduced him to a thing, a thing to be bought, sold, executed for debt, willed, and used as an article of merchandise. Slavery alone done this. Some authorities will now be cited to prove the correctness of this definition. So that's what he wrote in his book. And then he began to quote certain officials in Southern states who confirmed his description of slavery. One such man was Judge Stroud. The cardinal principle of slavery that the slave is not to be ranked among sentiments, beings, but among things obtained in all these slave states. So we keep going back to what the Dr. King described as thingification. Slaves, quote, this is the law in South Carolina uh, at that time, slaves shall be claimed, held, taken, reputed, and adjudged in law to be chattels, personal in the hands of their owners and possessors and their executors, administrators, and assigns to all intents and purposes whatsoever. The law in Louisiana, a slave is one who is in the power of the master to whom he belongs. The master may sell him, dispose of his person, his industry, his labor. He can do nothing, possess nothing, nor acquire anything but what must belong to his master. Now, I want to point out something to you. One of the problems with policing in this nation is that policing began, it literally started as slave patrols. Policing started as those groups of bounty um, hunters, if you will, who sought runaway slaves. And so the callousness, the hatefulness that 
obviously those slave bounty hunters had towards slaves. We see oftentimes in policing in the 21st century. And I say that because the law in South Carolina said, or in Louisiana, the master may sell him and then dispose of his person. That is talking about disposing of his body, disposing of his life. In other words, can kill him, can murder him with, with immunity. And, and that's literally what we see. We see it most visibly where it comes to policing. That, that's when we see the sort of the badges of, of slavery uh, come to the forefront during policing. When, in other words, we see a police officer, let's, let's think about Walter Scott, for example. Walter Scott was the man who was shot in the back multiple times by a Charleston, South Carolina police officer um, merely because he was running away. I mean, he wasn't doing anything. He was unarmed. He wasn't doing anything. I think there was uh, reportedly he had some, some uh, outstanding arrearage, child support arrearage, and that was it. But he wasn't a threat to anyone, had nothing in his hand, yet the officer shot him in the back multiple times, killing him. But see, that where does that come from? That comes from this notion of this person is, is a thing. The, the, this, this person is not a real person. This, this, and, and that's why the mantra was developed, black lives matter, black persons matter, black bodies matter, you see. Because this was the law, and in many people's minds, um, it, 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 it's, it's still there. Remnants of that thinking is still there. Lawrence wrote in his book, American slavery is a great sin, a complicated iniquity a gigantic barbarism, and it is evil, only evil, and that continuous. But the death of this wickedness is not very frequently sounded, if indeed it can be sounded. The magnitude of this crime is not often measured. Now keep in mind, this is a white man. Indeed, it is possible to determine its dimensions. Slavery has narcotized the conscious of the American people to a most alarming extent. A deep sleep has come over the moral sense, which it would seem cannot be broken by the cries and entries of, of three million of wretched bondmen. Are we not in imminent danger of being cursed with Pharaoh's hardness of heart? May we not be visited speedily with judicial blindness, such as was inflicted upon the doomed nations and cities of cities of, of antiquity. The standard of national morality has been degraded to the level of an infamous lower law enacted by the scheming political traitors. Watch this. Our national government in all its departments, executive, judicial, legislative, legislative, has been transformed into a pliant tool in the hands of unscrupulous oligarchy. The powerful American churches have ceased to be asylums for the oppressed defenders of the downtrodden, uncompromising foes of tyranny. They have become, on the contrary, the apologists of oppressors, a terror to the oppressed, and the only reliable bulwark, bulwark of American slavery. We see that so glaringly today. White evangelicals fit this description to a T. All right, so how could someone create such an evil institution? Well, there are a number of reasons why. First, the church doing slavery uh, the Southern Baptist Church, 
Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, these large denominations that white Americans uh, attended, they used Genesis 9 to teach that black people were cursed, were cursed, that God had cursed us. God had cursed us. And they also used scripture to teach that Europeans were the chosen people. This was offered by people like Aristotle, um, who said uh, whites were superior and were at the top of the human hierarchy chain. Uh, they taught that blacks didn't have souls. And I, I, I actually, a white man told me that um, in my lifetime, right, about 30 years ago. I had a, 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 a white pastor friend of mine tell me he resigned from a church because his deacons told him to stop inviting black people to the church because black people don't have souls. So this, this thinking still exists to this day. Now, as horrible as the Roman system of slavery was, and I'm going to tile this in in just a moment to why there was, and if, I mean, you should be seeing it, but why we, for 250 years of the 400 that we've been here, definitely could not create any wealth. So we can account for 250 years. We know why for 250 years we haven't been able to build wealth. We're going to come to that in just a moment. But as horrible as the Roman system of slavery was, the American system was even worse. Why? Well, first, it was based on race. Second, it made enslaved people property. Third, it was for perpetuity. It was permanent. It was lifetime. You and your um, seed, your descendants, would also be slaves unless someone, you know, freed you. It was also embedded in our Constitution, in the United States Constitution, which, by the way, still has seven or eight of those slave clauses in it to this day. And even our national anthem has remnants of the slave institution in it. It's the reason why I don't sing it and don't honor it, okay? And the cruelty and evilness of the slave system, the American slave system, again, put it above all others. And it was U.S. Supreme Court case after U.S. Supreme Court case after U.S. Supreme Court case that continued the awful legacy of slavery. Really right up until the Brown versus Board of Education case, which was handed down in 1955. That was a hundred years after slavery, the U.S. Supreme Court was still handing down slave deci or decisions that uh, if, 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 it, if, if they didn't enslave or support the enslavement of black people, they certainly, uh, the, the decisions supported the, uh, the degradation, the oppression of black people. Now, in Dr. Logan's book, The Betrayal of the Negro, he offers some reasons why slavery and Jim Crow, um, why blacks could not build wealth during those eras, some specific reasons. So, number one, the first reason that Dr. Logan offers is the economic deprivation of African Americans, he says, and he states the obvious, but it needs to be stated, is rooted deep in slavery in the system that we just highlighted. 
Now, listen at this for some specifics, okay? And, and this will help you understand. On the eve of the Civil War, so the night before the bullets started ringing out, nine out of 10 African Americans were slaves. Nine out of 10. The, the vast majority of those 4 million enslaved persons were field hands and domestic servants. All right, now watch this now. Nine out of 10 of blacks. All right, let me put this on the screen. Nine out of 10 of the blacks of the enslaved per nine out of 10 of the, of the blacks were slaves. And the vast majority of them were field hands and domestic servants. That's all they knew. They only knew how to work in the fields or work in the plantation owner's house. That's it. That's all the job skills they had. That's, that's, that's all the education they had. That's all they knew to do. All right? Keep in mind, we're talking about why there was no wealth building, why there's been no wealth building uh, in four centuries. For 250 of those four centuries, blacks were enslaved, and they had very, very little education in job skills other than to serve the plantation owner. So the vast majority of the 4 million slaves were field hands and domestic servants. A small number were carpenters, coopers, tailors, shoemakers, bootmakers, cabinet makers, seamstress. Others were employed in salt, salt works, iron and lead mines, on railroad construction, on river boats, and on docks. Some worked in textile mills, especially in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Louisiana. The exigencies of the war, which increased the number of Negroes engaged in non-agricultural pursuits, particularly in ironworks, coal mines, and salt works, clearly demonstrated that, quote, Negro labor, properly directed, was adaptable to diversified agriculture into a verified industrial program, close quote. But at the end of the war, most Southern Negroes, not a term we would use today, were without capital, no money, in other words, no assets, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, when the war began, they were primarily field hands and domestic servants. And when the war ended, they were still, that was the only labor they knew to do. Plus, they had nothing, penniless. Like Claude Anderson said, they, some of them were able to scrape together uh, maybe around 1.5% of the wealth of the country. That means 99.5% were penniless. Penniless. But at the end of the war, most Southern Negroes were without capital, without the rudiments of education. I mean, why? It was against the law to educate them. All they knew all they, uh, all the plantation owners wanted them to know was how to work the fields and how to serve in the houses. And without experience in work, except as agricultural field hands and domestic servants. So, when slavery ended, it is very understandable that African Americans were unable to build any kind of wealth because everything they did, everything they was, everything they were, pardon me, 
it, it was all owned by the slave, by the slave, by the enslaver. All right. So what we are going to do now is move into the period after slavery ended, and that is Reconstruction. Reconstruction lasted for about 10 years, 10, 11, 12 years. Started 1865 and essentially ended in 1877, about 12 years later. And it was a time where it seemed that blacks were going to be, you know, moving up the social strata, but it didn't work. It didn't work out. Some blacks were elected to Congress. Some blacks were able to start schools and different things, but it, it did not last long because the, the, the venom, the hatred, the, the anger of Southern whites was just overwhelming. And Northern whites, the ones who had fought to free enslaved blacks, were all too happy to appease the South. And after all, they were still brothers in the flesh. So they were not really going to do uh, much more to see blacks reach um, equity, right? So the issue was, okay, we freed you, but we're not going to do anything to help you reach full equality, full economic and political and social equality. So Reconstruction lasted for just a short period of time. After that, started the period called Redemption. And this is when the South, with the approval of the North begin to, in their minds, redeem themselves and to reestablish white rule and white supremacy. It's a period that we commonly call Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Now, where did Jim Crow, where did the name come from? Jim Crow was a fictitious, lowly black character created in the early, in the early to mid-19th century by a white man named Thomas Rice. This lowly black character became the character um, of many minstrels' shows. So he became this fictitious character of many minstrel shows where white men dressed in blackface and basically traveled the country ridiculing black men. And so Jim Crow became this racial slur. And eventually it became synonymous with black code laws that Southern states enacted after slavery ended to continue the subjugation of blacks. So it started out as a minstrel show, but then it evolved into being associated with all of the black code laws that were implemented by Southern states with the approval of the federal government. At that time, the federal government was, um, the, the Rutherford B. Hayes was the president. And again, he said, you Southerners go about your business. Uh, doing what you please, um, so long as we are able to maintain the White House. All right, and and I'm quoting again from uh, Dr. Logan's book, and I keep bringing this book up because you should get a copy of this book. A quote from a Southern historian in Dr. Logan's book, the Southern white historian said, quote, the new laws, he's referring to the, to the black code laws, the new laws relegated to a distinct caste 
all individuals possessing a certain amount of Negro blood, usually one eighth. So those states, North Carolina, my home state, South Carolina, Georgia, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, um, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, all of these states begin, the slaveholding states begin to enact black code laws. And the purpose of the black code laws were to basically undermine the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Because remember, those three amendments were passed during Reconstruction to uh, help blacks um, reach equality. But the Southern states enacted those black code laws to undermine the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, basically. So Jim Crow was the law. It wasn't just um, people being mean, but it became the law through those black code laws. And Jim Crow was also the lifestyle. It was the custom. And I, being 60 years old, can remember um, Jim Crow. I can remember as a kid there were certain stores that we, when I used to go to the doctor, my doctor, when I was a kid, his name was Dr. Hall, H-A-W-E. At Dr. Hall's office, when you walked into the front of his, front of his office, the blacks went to the right door and the whites went to the, to the white side. So you had a black side, you had a white side. I, I'll always remember that. And certain restaurants, if we wanted to order something, we had to go to, to the back of the restaurant. We couldn't, this is in my lifetime, we couldn't go to the front of the restaurant. Um, you know, we couldn't uh, really look uh, white men in the eyes. You know, when you, when I can, I can remember seeing the older generation, when they would talk to them, they'd be, you know, looking down and, and um, wouldn't have, you know, speak because they knew what would happen, right? They could get arrested, get beat down, and their families would never see them again. Uh, contract labor, uh, all of these things are relics of, of Jim Crow. So, during this Jim Crow period, violence was, was very much the rule of the day. Um, in Dr. Logan's book, he talks about such violent white terrorist violent groups as, quote, the Regulators, the Jayhawkers, the Black Horse Cavalry, the Knights of the White Camellia, the Constitutional Union Guards, the Pale Faces, the White Brotherhood, the Council of Safety, the 76 Association, the Rifle Clubs of South Carolina, and above all, the Ku Klux Klan. They terrorized, they maimed, and they killed a large number of Negroes. Now watch this. When I read this, I think about the Bloods and the Crips, right? I think about all the, the gangs that have been a part of the black and Latino communities. And, um, but before we started doing it, they were already doing it. They already created their gangs, okay? The Regulators the Jayhawkers. And, 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 and I say that because, you know, I hear people talking about how horrible and heinous uh, the Bloods and the Crips are, and they, and they, and they are. Don't misunderstand me. They, they uh, do bad things. 
But before they existed, there were some awful, awful, awful white gangs. And their and their and their their target was anyone of color, especially black people. I mean, look, look at the name of the regulators, the Jayhawkers, the Black Horse Cavalry, the Knights of the White Camellia, the Constitutional Union Guards, the Pale Faces, the White Brotherhood, the Council of the Safety. I mean, they sound just like street gangs. And we could throw in there the GOP. <laughs> I mean. I mean, really, seriously. And um, in fact, I watched a documentary some years ago about the creation of the L.A. gangs. And they said that they actually started because they needed protection from, from pol white police officers and other racist white people. So they said we actually started not to fight each other, but as protection against people who were brutalizing us. You see. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Now, I'm coming to a close. So during Jim Crow, Dr. Logan said that the failure, that here's the second reason or way um, white America was able to keep black America from building wealth. First, we said it was just, just slavery. Second, the failure of the federal government to accept responsibility for a long-range, comprehensive, and intelligent policy of economic habilitation of the emancipated Negroes. And he says in his book, some 50 private organizations wrote a memorable chapter in the history of American philanthropy by providing substantial relief and in inaugurating educational programs for the freedmen in the South. But obviously, the job was too stupendous for private philanthropy. Either private capital or government action therefore had to provide the freedmen with economic opportunities to undergird their political and civil rights. Southern capital could not provide the jobs. Northern capital, especially in the immediately after the war, found more profitable investments in the East and West than in the South. The black codes of the Southern states between 1865 and 1866, showed clearly the determination to deny the freedmen equal economic opportunity. During the critical period immediately after the war, federal action alone could provide the freedmen with the economic opportunities without which their political and civil liberties would have little foundation. And that's exactly what Dr. King said. Dr. King said, it is a cruel joke, a cruel joke to say to a people, pull yourself up by your bootstraps when the people saying that have worked diligently to make sure they don't have any boots or straps. So not only did slavery damage us in terms of wealth, and in many other ways. But the fact that the federal government has never accepted responsibility for allowing the atrocities that occur to us to happen and to then take responsibility for repairing those atrocities. I'm talking about reparations. That's what this is referring to. Another huge failure that I'm going to spend some time talking about next week is the failure of the government to, to assist African Americans in becoming and remaining landowners. Oh, I'm going to talk about that next week. In this country, 
much of the wealth of this country and the laws are built around home and land ownership. So, we're going to look at that next week. Also, the exclusion of African Americans from the labor movement, from unions. Early on, after slavery ended, black Americans could not become a part of unions. Let me show you what I mean as we come to a close. So these are the unions and the numbers of African Americans in those unions. So the union for barbers, only 200 African Americans were permitted to be a part of those, that union in 1890. Only 50 were permitted to be a part of the brick and clay workers, 1,500 longshoremen, 33 painters, decorators, and paper hangers union, and 1,500 in the tobacco workers union. So black Americans basically in 1890 was a part of only five unions and in very small numbers. These are extremely small numbers. Remember, we said after slavery ended, there were some 4 million people, 4 million uh, freed slaves. And yet we see from these numbers, only 200 of them in 1890 were a part of the barber union. 50, the brick, you know, the brick masons, clay workers, 50 in that union, 1,500 longshoremen union. Oh, uh, what is that? 33 in the painters, decorators, paper hangers union. 1,500 uh, tobacco workers union. Now, 1,900, 10 years later, uh, the numbers had increased, but was still very, very, very small when you compare these small numbers to 4 million newly freed black Americans. So the point I'm making is slavery obviously prevented us from creating wealth. Jim Crow continued the oppression of blacks and did everything it could through black code laws to prevent us from creating wealth. So that's the first 250 years of us being here of slavery. And then another hundred years before Jim Crow black code laws were overruled that would have put us in the 1960s, actually in my lifetime. So the question becomes, have, can, can we expect African Americans to have built to, to build measurable wealth in the last 60 years when we now are in an era of systemic racism. So remember early on, I told you I was going to walk you through the 400 years that we've been here in three parts, slavery, Jim Crow, and the, this, this era that we're currently living in, this era of systemic racism. So we couldn't build wealth during slavery. We couldn't build wealth during Jim Crow. What about now? And even if all the barriers were removed in the last 60 years, they haven't been, but even if they were, would that still be enough time for us to catch up after 350 years? 
of subjugation and oppression, would that still be enough time? So do you see why the average white family has $188,000 of, of medium wealth and the average black family has $24,000, $25,000? You see why? Do, can you see it? Or are you thinking, well, it's black culture. So if you're thinking that, you're completely dismissing the 250 years of slavery, the 100 years of Jim Crow apartheid segregation where the law prevented us from building any wealth. So you're just going to completely throw that to the side and say, well, black Americans are not building wealth because there are things in the black community that, really? Okay. Come back next week. Let me finish my case. And if you still think that, then okay. Okay. So next week, I should be able to wrap it up. Be part five of why after 400 years black Americans have not created an immeasurable wealth collectively. Today you heard from my expert, Dr. King, and he said he gave us his rationale, which I believe he was right on point. He said again that African Americans have been thingified, enslaved, never repaired, and we had to compete with people, immigrants, European immigrants, who were given an elevator up while we were placed on an elevator going down. So, I'll see you next week when we finish talking about this. Peace.